Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for walking across the street in the rain. Um, and uh, we're going to get started. Uh, my talk is a vision for API machinery. Um, and it's my vision, and who am I? Uh, since I've been here a long time, but there's many people at this conference, and maybe you don't know me. Uh, I'm, I'm Daniel Smith. I've been working on Kubernetes since before it was open source. Uh, I work for Google. There's some contact information. Um, so although the, the, some of the details in this talk might just be my vision in particular, I think the broad strokes are shared by a lot of people. And so I hope you'll agree with me. <laughs> so I've divided this talk into three sections. And these are the most original sections you've ever seen, I'm sure. Uh, where we came from, where we are, and where we should go as a project. Um, so, so first, uh, where did we come from? And I want to tell you three stories here. The first story is Kubernetes up and to the right. And I don't even need to say too much about this story. I think you all know that Kubernetes has been incredibly successful. Uh, the amount of uptake has just been phenomenal. There's something like 8,000 people here at this conference, which is like 10x growth for every year of the project or something ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's really crazy. Um, so, and, and the reason I, tell, I, I say that is just to sort of set the, set the stage for everything that I'm going to say next. Uh, and the, the next thing I want to talk about is our, is our code. So I want to give you just a very, very brief tour of where did our code for API machinery, how did it evolve, how did, where did we start, what's our, what is our uh, trajectory? So I went and dug up some of the very earliest code uh, for API machinery. Uh, very earliest, like uh, uh, this, is, this is from a revision where I moved things into an API package uh, instead of having it scattered all over. Uh, uh, so so here's, the, here's the endpoints object. You can see there's no header. Um, there's a very brief uh, comment there. There's no real structure. And below it, I have the function that parses it. You don't have to understand this. The point is, it's very simple. Uh, there's not much here. There's no machinery, really. We had to write a parse x for every x in the system. Um, not very user friendly. Not very repeatable, easy to make mistakes. Shortly after that, uh, I think it was probably me, we've got a JSON base here, which is embedded into every type. So we have some consistent things here. We have a, a sort of a type and an ID and a timestamp. Um, we've got JSON and YAML tags now. Uh, and, and we're starting to get to the point where we could probably have some generic Marshall and Marshall functions. Not long after that, we have, uh, uh, we've changed the name to type meta. It's grown more things. Um, we've got some comments. Not long after that. <laughs> You can see it gets longer and longer. It goes off the screen. I, di I didn't even pull up a recent one because all, all that happens is it just gets longer and longer and adds some proto tags. Um, you can see now we've got detailed documentation on every field. The machinery like, puts that out into the discovery documents. Um, so the, the point of this is to, is to show you the, the trajectory. It's getting more complicated, more sophisticated, more features, uh, more places for you to document your intent. And the machinery does more things for you. Like I'm, not, I'm not showing you the, the code for serializing and deserializing, because we could spend the whole talk on that. And that's not what you came here for. The final story I want to tell you about where we've been is about sort of conceptually the path that we've walked together as a uh, community, as an open source community, scheduling cluster workloads. Uh, and, and I call this the abstraction treadmill. So I want to introduce the, the how do I manage function, uh, which you you uh, give it a thing, and it spits out a way you manage that thing. Um, before Kubernetes came into existence, the, the industry, I would say, knew how to manage at least two things. Uh, computers can be uh, managed as VMs. Uh, binaries and dependencies can be packaged into, into containers. It makes them easier uh, to manage. When Kubernetes first came out, we had pods, replica sets, and, and uh, deployments as management technologies. Um, although replica sets had a different name at the time. Uh, <laughs> I won't go into that. Um, as Kubernetes grew up, we grew more management systems for, for pods. 
Uh, and and, and uh, I think you all probably know, like pods are collections of containers. Replica sets are uh, uh, striping pods across machines. Deployments uh, take replica sets and let you add a, a staged rollout. Um, but we've come up with more interesting ways of uh, managing pods. Uh, staple sets that are particularly uh, complicated and interesting. Um, and so you end up with the question, how do you manage your daemon sets, your staple sets, your deployments? One way is kube control apply. Maybe you have a CI CD system. Um, kube control apply works particularly well if there's not much in the way of parameterization you have to pass to these things. Um, maybe if you're a little bit more complicated, you have a CI CD system. But if your workload is even more complicated and you know something specific about it, you can do better. You can write a custom operator. Um, and uh, uh, so then the obvious question is, how do you manage your custom operator? And um, as you walk the, uh, the abstraction ladder here, your, your stuff is getting more and more abstract, but that means the interface is getting simpler and simpler, unless you're doing it wrong. Uh, but the interface should be getting simpler and simpler. Uh, and, and this means eventually you're going to get to something that you can manage with very few uh, uh, templatized variables. You can, you can basically manage it with a deployment, use kube control apply. Uh, and and uh, you know, worst case, you can layer it again, so you end up with an operator operator. And uh, I want I want to say that that that's that's where it stops. You you don't need to get more complicated than that. You don't need to get more abstract than that, right? An operator operator is just another operator. So we can manage an arbitrary amount of uh, technical infrastructure with the concepts that we've developed. We don't need to develop more concepts. Uh, all we need is APIs per operators. OK, so uh, with that thought in mind, uh, let's talk about where we are as a project. Kubernetes, the, the pro and, and I'm going to compare and contrast Kubernetes and API machinery, which maybe you've never thought of before uh, doing, but uh, bear with me. I think it'll be interesting. Uh, so, so Kubernetes, the, the project, has a consistent API, and some people like to say a resource model. Um, uh, because API by itself can be a confusing word. Sometimes people think of individual API calls, like a, like a, like a put or a get, or um, if you're doing something more custom with gRPC, like you can just have arbitrary words. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the resource model, right? Like all of the resources that Kubernetes exposes uh, have the same verbs, the same words. And, and, and by the way, when I say resource, I mean the, the, the type. I like to call individual items uh, objects. Uh, just in case that's not clear. Um, so the Kubernetes has a consistent resource model. It is compartmental and re reusable. And, and this means like uh, the, the things that we make API objects for, the things that we make resources for, uh, are um, you, they're, they're little pieces of functionality that you can mix up and combine with, with uh, operators and controllers and, and higher level abstractions. So API machinery, in contrast, supports an extensible API. And we have two primary uh, modes of extensions. I, I'm going to argue one is types, or you can, you can add more resources to the system. The other one is policy. You can, you can have uh, like admission webhooks or uh, authorization webhooks. So, so there's like two, two primary dimensions of extensible uh, plugin hooks in API machinery. So what's the difference between API machinery and Kubernetes? Um, I, I'm going to go through some compare and contrast uh, slides real quick. So uh, Kubernetes and API machinery both have APIs. Kubernetes APIs are, you know, and these are not complete lists. These are just to give you the idea. So uh, uh, the, the real list for Kubernetes APIs is quite long. Uh, but deployment pod, endpoints, node, like services, uh, those, are, those are Kubernetes specific APIs. API machinery APIs are much more general, like custom resource definition. That's CRDs. It's how you, the primary way of adding types to the system, API service. Uh, the way of adding uh, aggregated APIs, or addition, another way of adding types to the system. Namespace, a container for other types, um, other objects. Uh, webhook configuration object, these are API machinery APIs. Uh, all of these things are served out of the binary cube API server. Uh, so uh, operationally, if you've ever tried to run Kubernetes, API server is one of the binaries you run. And it runs a collection of code. Some of it is Kubernetes-specific, and some of it, I'll argue, is API machinery-specific. 
The Kubernetes code is like the, all the, the handlers for the built-in resources, the, the uh, validation code, right? So, so like node, pod, you know, all the, the validation code. Uh, there's some uh, especially interesting custom sub-resource sub uh, handlers, like uh, the, the logs uh, endpoint or the proxy or the port forward. Like those, uh, those like break glass ways of getting out of the Kubernetes uh, API model. Um, API, sir, uh, API machinery, on the other hand, uh, we own the aggregator, which is like the front door of API server, uh, the, the thing that serves the CRDs, the policy hook calls, the, the entire framework around which you insert your uh, resource uh, handlers into. So we own large parts of it, and, and it's kind of like mixed together. Um, everybody publishes their API. API machinery, unfortunately, publishes in the same place as Kubernetes. Uh, but we also have uh, some, some meta stuff in another place. Um, controllers, the other aspect, like all the business logic of, of Kubernetes goes into controllers. So, so Kubernetes has the controllers that enact your will for the uh, deployments, replica sets, endpoints, nodes, you know, all that, all that good stuff. And API machinery also has some controllers because we, we own some facets of the system. So the two main ones are the, the namespace lifecycle, like you delete a namespace, it goes and cleans up all the uh, objects that are sitting in that namespace. Um, we also own the garbage collector, so you, you delete the uh, root of a tree of objects and it walks them and deletes them for you. Um, so that, that's API machinery owned. Uh, and all of this stuff is in the controller manager. Uh, in addition, and, and I've broken out here, uh, like obviously the controllers I just mentioned live there, but uh, in addition, like API Machinery also owns the like uh, framework that you use to, to, to write controllers. So like there's this reflector that watches API changes, Informer that like packages those up, Work queue that lets you shard those across multiple threads. Um, all, nearly all of the controllers use this mechanism. Um, and and uh, if I were splitting it up into even more fine grain detail, I, I would say that some of the controllers in, in uh, Controller Manager are cloud specific, but there's another effort uh, working on, on that problem, so. More abstractly, I, I I'll say meta stuff is all API machinery, and by meta, I mean like stuff that is about other stuff. Uh, so, so like the, the object meta, the, the data that we put at the top of every object to help you introspect the system. That's, that's the, the format of that is owned by API machinery. Uh, the concept of optimistic concurrency that you can uh, write and read objects in a safe way, uh, even in the face of many other readers and writers, that's, that's API machinery concept. Owner references, which uh, power the garbage collector, the various wire formats, uh, uh, for both for watch and for proto, the status, the error return format, this is all stuff that API machinery owns. On the other hand, concrete stuff, like, like specifically applied stuff, is mostly Kubernetes specific. Um, so liveness, readiness checks, like that, that is not an API machinery concept. That's a very specific uh, contract between Kubelet and the, the pods that it is running, the containers that it is running. Service selectors, uh, yeah, there's a list there. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, API machinery, I tried to think of like what are concrete decisions that API machinery has made. Uh, one that came to mind is the, the, the flat namespace hierarchy, the fact that you don't have namespaces nested. Uh, that's an example. There might be a few others, but that's, that was the clearest one that came to mind. So um, on a somewhat more sad note, uh, both API machinery and Kubernetes have some operational issues. Uh, how many of you here have ever tried to upgrade your Kubernetes installation? Okay. So did, did, did you have a good experience every time? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's tricky, right? Um, API machinery also has some, some issues. Uh, there's no coordination between replicas of API server, for example. Uh, I'm sure, especially as people add more CRDs to the system, we're going to get requests to scale uh, to support larger numbers of objects. And we've already gotten these requests. <laughs> um, and something that I haven't seen discussed too much, if at all, is that these operational issues kind of have a cross product, right? So there's, there's like, uh, there's concerns that are basically completely Kubernetes, like I want to add a field to my V1 resource. Uh, there's concerns that are almost entirely API machinery. I want to add a new proto format. Um, and these things, like, since we roll out right now, uh, changes in both at the same time in lockstep, 
uh, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to be sure that you've tested the, the whole cross product, right? Um, yeah, so in spite of that, Kubernetes clearly has lots of uptake, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning. OK, so forward looking. This, uh, this section, I've also got three, three parts. What are our goals is first? So I think our goal as a product, uh, as, as a project, uh, we've got two groups of people that we want to support, the Kubernetes ecosystem and the, the Kubernetes project. And I, I really want to argue that these are the, this is the, actually the same group of people, um, or, or that at least that we can, we can work in a way that it makes improvements for both groups at the same time. Um, so when I think of the, the ecosystem in particular, I think interoperability is like the primary thing that you need for an ecosystem. Uh, because y y if your components can't talk to each other, you don't really have an ecosystem. You have a bunch of islands. Um, and for interoperability, like there's, there's client-side interoperability, uh, like cube control. I, I, think, uh, I think cube control is, if, if we do things right, you should only need cube control as a command line client. Um, and and I'm, uh, this also applies to, to libraries for languages. Uh, so right now, there's a bunch of functionality in Cube Control that it, it, you basically have to rewrite if you want to do it from like Python or uh, Java or something. So uh, I've only written Cube Control down here, but this this loop basically solves the problem for all of the the client code. Uh, we still need some client side constructs like the controller, uh, the, the, the framework e bits we've written for controllers. But basically, like if stuff doesn't work for CRDs. Uh, stuff in queue control doesn't work for CRDs. Move something to the feature, to, to, the, to the server. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, just keep going until everything works seamlessly for CRDs. Uh, and I think Phil has already started, Phil and team are already working on that. So uh, I'm not going to focus on it too much. Um, the next part, which I'll spend a little bit more time on, is server side op interoperability. Um, how many of you have seen one of these before? I'm, I'm sure none of you have a legacy system that you need to manage, but maybe you know somebody who does. Um, so there's, there's sort of two ways that you can hook up a legacy system with Kubernetes, like, like a control plane type legacy system. Like maybe it's your, your network switches or who knows what it is. So this, this first one is really the recommended way of doing this. Um, it, it, is, it is really the, it gives clients the, uh, the, the primitives they expect, and it lets you cleanly uh, command your legacy system the way it expects. And this is, uh, this is like uh, clients are, are here, they read and write to us, a, a, you've made a CRD, um, and then you've also written a controller uh, which reads from the CRD. Uh, it sends imperative commands over to your legacy system, and it's got like a pull loop, or maybe if your legacy system supports a pub sub, it can watch it or something like that. And it pulls data from your legacy system and writes the status back to the CRD. Uh, and this, this, if this looks familiar, it's basically exactly the operator pattern, uh, just applied to a legacy system. Um, so this is, this is really the way I, I recommend you hook up a legacy system to the Kubernetes control plane. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's actually one of the better stories for this because you can just write your, control plane, your, your controller uh, separate. You don't have to recompile anything about API server. Uh, so I recommend this. However, I've had multiple people request to uh, bring their own API server. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I can't recommend this, but people want to do it. Um, so, what, is it, what does it take to, to, uh, to hook up your API server as a source of truth? Um, basically, the, the design looks like this. So you've, you've got the aggregator, you make an API service, and, and you've got some sort of shim or something between your legacy system and, and uh, uh, the aggregator. Uh, so if we zoom in there, it's pretty easy to imagine how you can write a, write a shim. Uh, to take like a post command and turn it into a create on your legacy system, right? And put, get, list, these are pretty easy. Um, it's less easy to imagine how you really implement watch with the, with the correct semantics. Uh, and, and so my, my point of putting this up here isn't that I think this is a great thing or that we should spend a lot of time supporting it. My point is that it's not clear to people how they would even do this, right? We haven't written down what exactly it means to be interoperable from a server perspective. Is it required for people to implement watch? 
I would like to say it is. I think that that is a, a really important part of the Kubernetes API experience, but it's hard. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't written down the uh, compatibility guidelines. So that, that's really my point in, in bringing this up, is uh, uh, it's hard to be interoperable. And uh, clear guidelines are the difference between your legacy systems looking like this or like this. So how can we support the Kubernetes project at the same time? I actually think uh, as, we, as there's, a, there's a drive to like do more and more APIs as CRDs, I, I think uh, we can really support both the Kubernetes project specifically and the ecosystem at large with many of the same actions. Uh, so, so clarifying our boundaries, um, conformance testing. I think these are, these are great uses of our time, uh, even if we weren't considering the ecosystem at large and just the, the Kubernetes project itself. Okay, so this is the fun, the fun part is now I'm going to give you a series of ideas um, and uh, in, increasingly harebrained perhaps, uh, but I, I really think that uh, many of these are composable, like we can pick and choose which ones we do, uh, and I think all of them drive at a, a, uh, a better way of operating in general. So, uh, and, and I might get a little technical here and talk a little bit about the, the internals, but uh, it's, this, is, this is gonna be far from a complete proposal. This is just to give you a flavor for the, for the sort of things that I'd like to see us do in the future. Um, so like I mentioned before, today we run the API server, and uh, it's got a lot of stuff built into it. So client talks to the aggregator, which might forward to the built-in Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, resource handlers, and uh, if it's not there, it might forward to the CRD um, API server, but there's also the aggregator might send you off to the metrics API server or some other API servers, and that's through like network connections. Um, what if we split this apart? So we actually had a process that was owned by API machinery and separate processes that were owned by the Kubernetes project at large. Uh, I, I'm thinking in particular of the, the uh, CVE we had the other day. It'd be great to uh, uh, it'd be great to have been able to upgrade this uh, aggregator front door without touching the rest of the system. Uh, I have another slide about that in a second. Um, but this is just a sketch of a design. It does increase the operational complexity a little bit. I personally think it's worth it. Um, you can come to the API machinery sig list and argue with me if you don't. Um, but the, the basic idea is, like, let's, let's move the, the Kubernetes built-ins. Let's move them out to a separate API server. Like maybe for performance, we need to use a, a Unix domain socket or something like that to communicate with it uh, and co-locate it with the, with the front door here. But the basic idea is to clarify who is responsible for what component, right? Like I'd like a binary that API machinery owns and a binary that the, the Kubernetes project owns, right? Uh, maybe, maybe even multiple. Like, like uh, 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 at that point, it's, it's no longer like my personal problem. But uh, I think it would be nifty if that uh, Kubernetes-owned uh, process. Maybe uh, they can individual owners of APIs in there could either switch their thing to a CRD, or uh, maybe they could operate a API server binary that serves just that API, so that so that there's complete ownership of of the component. Right. This, of course, is just a it's just a sketch. It's, I've got my little construction worker in the corner there uh, to tell you it's not a detailed design. It's definitely not implemented. You can even imagine moving the CRD process out uh, also, so the binaries get even simpler. Um, I, I, you, depending on who is in your cluster and how isolated you want them to be, I could even imagine the CRD API server doing something crazy like forking a new process for every for every CRD. Um, I don't know. Interesting idea, hopefully. Uh, so the other main binary in our system is, is a controller manager. And uh, today, uh, we have all the controllers in one place. And like there's some that are logically API machinery, as I mentioned. There's some that are logically Kubernetes. Uh, there's many that are logically belong to the, the cloud provider. And uh, there's already a work in progress to split that out. So we're soon going to have a controller manager and a cloud controller manager. but Maybe we should think about having three. We should run the API machinery controllers in one, and the built-in controllers and the cloud provider controllers. Like, three is not that many more than two. <laughs> um, so why not go even further and, and just run every controller in its own binary? 
And uh, I've, I've heard two reasons. The, the, the one that I buy is, is on this slide, like it's expensive. Um, uh, every controller basically caches every object in the system. Uh, so it's very expensive to split them out into, into many separate binaries. Um, expensive at runtime in terms of RAM and CPU. Uh, the other argument I've heard is that it is more, much more operationally complex to do this. I don't actually personally buy that one. I think, uh, like we're software engineers, this is what we do. We can figure that one out. <laughs> the, the cost one is a little bit harder. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about more, more crazy ideas. I don't know, maybe they're not that crazy. I don't think they're crazy. Uh, so what if we uh, refactored our process? I'm, I'm, I'm actually personally frustrated with the cadence of releases of the, the Kubernetes project at large, um, it, both in terms of like how long it takes to fix something, uh, in terms of uh, people rush to get in at the last minute, because these releases happen like every three months or something, so there, there's really not that many trains leaving the station, so it's very important to get your feature on one. Uh, I, I would really love, uh, and, and so th those, are, those are like constraints faced by the Kubernetes system, right? Like not everybody wants to update their, their, uh, their cluster all the time, so it's hard. Um, but we, uh, API Machinery, don't necessarily need to face those constraints. So uh, if we have binary level components that we own, why not release them more frequently, uh, like every two weeks, like, right? And, and uh, the, when the uh, Kubernetes project uh, finishes their release cycle and they're ready to ship, they pick the uh, API machinery re release that's green and has the features they want, right? So I, I, I think that that idea is really appealing to me. Uh, I know I am motivated personally when I can put a change in and, and it goes through the pipeline and, and, and it's live and uh, I don't have to worry about it, right? The, the broader Kubernetes release cycle makes that really hard. Like for some changes, especially API changes, you have to, it's not a very complicated change, it's just gotta be split among so many releases. Like you might be spending a year on, on, on some field uh, deprecation or removal uh, movement. So really what I'm saying here is the Kubernetes version is sort of one dimension of your cluster and the API machinery version is sort of a, a different dimension. Uh, and I think it's totally legitimate that you may want to change your schemas but not your mechanism. Uh, that it is like get the new the new version of your Kubernetes objects. Uh, I think it's also legitimate that you might want to uh, change mechanisms, but not your schemas. Like I want to get a security fix, uh, but I don't want to change my pod semantics, right? Um, especially the recent CVE we had in API Machinery. I, I didn't fill this out, but about by my uh, counting, it's ten days since last CVE. Um, uh, I, I didn't fill it out because I wasn't sure there wasn't going to be another one. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think it would have been great to, to uh, have that flaw located specifically in uh, a, a one binary. So you, you can get the fix for that without worrying that you're changing the semantic behavior of your Kubernetes resources, right? Because uh, those, if those things are located in completely separate binaries, um, you don't have to worry about that. And uh, basically what I'm saying is there's different risk profiles for an API machinery upgrade versus a Kubernetes API upgrade. So thinking even, even more large scale, what if we did a little social structure refactoring? Uh, I can actually imagine a GitHub org for API machinery. Maybe we need to come up with a better name. Um, but I, I, can, I can actually man imagine making larger changes to the Kubernetes project that enable us to, to move faster uh, and, and encourage, us to, uh, uh, encourage us to build the right things. Um, there's, there's a uh, sort of joke law out there that you end up shipping your org. Um, so if we want to ship things in a certain way, maybe we need to refactor our organization, organization to, uh, to uh, facilitate that. All right, so. Uh, is there any actual practical way to uh, make these changes, or is this uh, a, a vision that cannot be realized? Uh, and I think there's sort of two approaches we could take to, to make progress uh, towards uh, some of these goals. The first one, and I'm sorry, but I'm mentioning some technical details about the Kubernetes uh, uh, project. Uh, we have this uh, staging directory. Uh, the first one is we could focus on the staging directory uh, this, is, this has been our way classically of 
carving out pieces of the Kubernetes project that we want to expose externally, like the, the client library or API machinery or whatever. So we could, we could uh, uh, embrace that and add even more things to it. Um, and I know staging is everybody's favorite directory, but I think there is maybe a, a, a better way, uh, which is basically uh, make a new repository, set up the process that we want to have in that repository. Uh, and that includes like healthy development test release practices. So basically get our release story in order um, and then move a small piece of functionality over, uh, consume that in the main repository and just keep repeating that process. I think this is, uh, has a better chance of eventually arriving at the release semantics that I would really like to see. Uh, and repeat until everybody's happy. So, uh, that sounds like a lot of work. Uh, is it worth it? And I, I, I have, these are the factors that I, that I think are, are relevant. This is really a growth rate multiplier on the ecosystem. Uh, one could argue that the ecosystem has been having no problem with growing, but I think it could be growing even faster and healthier. Um, this gives architectural clarity for new entrants to the system, right? Like, you come into Kubernetes, you read our docs, it's not clear, like, if you're reading a general principle, a general fact about all the resources or a specific thing about a, a specific resource. Uh, if you dig into the code, it's not clear if you're uh, writing some, some code that, uh, or if you're modifying some code that needs to go to an individual API author or to the API machinery SIG. Um, uh, often in our triage meeting, we're like, this is not SIG API machinery, this is like SIG architecture, or this is SIG node because you're, you're changing this node thing, or this is the storage because you're adding the storage API. So uh, I, I think that that's actually worth quite a lot. Uh, and this is sort of uh, tautologically true, but if we do this, we end up with improved testing and confidence because really it's impossible to do this without uh, really good tests that represent what Kubernetes does with the API machinery outputs. So, and my personal opinion, I think uh, our velocity in terms of features would be slower at first perhaps, but eventually get faster. Um, and it's, it's definitely like, it's not, an, it's, not a, uh, it's not an important part of velocity, but uh, in terms of number commits, uh, lines of code changes, I, I think that's just definitely going to be uh, uh, faster this way. I mean, it, it, it's good in terms of morale to be able to like make progress. Uh, but it, I think the, the important things are, are the other ones on this slide. Uh, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Um, if you like these ideas or you want to try and talk me out of it, uh, you can join the API machinery mailing list, come to our meeting. Uh, I think we'll probably have to talk about some of this in the SIG architecture uh, mailing list and, and meeting. So I, I would love to hear your feedback. Uh, I think uh, uh, it, it'd be great to, to I, I've heard from a lot of people today uh, or uh, at this conference that they like this general, these general ideas. So I hope that uh, you'll join me. So thank you. I think I have a few minutes for questions. So, yeah. So what was the reason for the decision for a flat namespace hierarchy? <laughs> What's the reason behind the flat namespace hierarchy? Sorry, no hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, for, for, for no hierarchy. That's actually a good question. Um, I, I, you know, I think that decision might have been made while I was out on paternity leave. <laughs> <laughs> Etcd doesn't have a query. Well, it's, it's the common etcd doesn't have a query. Yeah, etcd doesn't have an etcd doesn't have an aggregation mechanism, but it actually is a uh, directory structure. So uh, you could like imagine nesting the namespace objects. Um, uh, no, I think it, I think it was simplicity. Uh, uh, it is having a hierarchy makes things complicated, and it wasn't clear at the time whether that complexity would be a good idea or not. Seems like you can use Kubernetes. If you produce everything to CRD, it seems like you can use it to orchestrate 
VMs on dirt metal if you want to be your own GCP competitor. Yeah. So is it pretty much reduced to those two things then? Yeah, so the question is, does this pretty much reduce the API surface to uh, API server with the CRD implementation and just controllers? And I think the answer is mostly. Uh, there's a couple exceptions, which are some of the built-in resources do a few extra things that you can't do with a CRD, and I'm not sure it'd be a good idea to do with a CRD. For example, the uh, uh, service object will allocate an IP address for you. Um, that is not a thing that we would support. Well, maybe you could implement it with a webhook, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you would want to. Yeah, David is shaking his head, too. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I think yes, and I think the Kubernetes API objects, API resources that, uh, that don't support this yet should be changed. Like maybe those were, uh, like specifically the surface with the IP allocation, I think that was a poor architectural decision at the beginning. It should have been handled asynchronously by a controller. Um, some resources, I think, are, would be fairly easy, but I think uh, many, resources, many resources would require like uh, care and attention, which is basically why I, I suggest leaving the, the uh, binary, um, and we can make it the problem of the people who <laughs> own the, the API. Uh, maybe they will see the benefits, maybe not, either way. Yeah, so you're, you're talking about this, this box in particular, this cluster proxy service thing. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I did gloss over it. Uh, and the question is, that, that's a large change. So really, I think what I'd like is for, so, so we had a major CVE in the, in the proxy code, basically. Um, and these endpoints are not really very natural ones for, from a perspective of the, of the Kubernetes resource model. So, uh, and, and I haven't, uh, obviously I don't have a detailed design proposal, but the basic sketch here, the idea is the aggregator is extended um, so that we can register sub-resources and redirect those to, to external services. Um, and it wouldn't have to be directing people directly to nodes. Like I, I, I see like a, like a parallel uh, uh, service, like a, like, a, like a control plane type service that handles these requests and then, then like basically take the code that's currently today an API server, move it to a separate service, redirect clients to that service. Uh, I, I, and this is, this is isolation reasons. Maybe I'm uh, overtraining on the CV we had, but. Uh, <laughs> that's a better argument. I just think like it's a non-starter to always send clients directly to that. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's not what I was I not proposing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want a different front door for the proxy code so it can run in a different uh, security domain. I'm more on board. Cool. Um, has there been any discussions about adding relationship in the meta between objects, primarily for sort of a little yap shaving of the controller logic? Uh, and so the question is whether we've thought about adding some relationship information to the, to the metadata for objects. Uh, we do have the controller reference, uh, or the, sorry, the owner reference uh, field, and that's garbage collector uses that. Uh, does that not serve your needs? Yeah, so, so, so the, the question is, uh, um, right, like we leave services to connect to their pods with label selectors. Uh, could we do that in some more general way? I think actually we've discussed adding a garbage collector, uh, like a, a new concept for the garbage collector, which uh, lets you denote in your, um, in your open API discovery that this particular set of field is a reference to some other object. Uh, so that would actually be really powerful. Like it would be useful not just for the garbage collector, but you could follow, you could like navigate the, the directory tree generically. Um, 
OK, last, probably last question. Yeah, I, th I think the question is, like, why is it so hard to get a delete protection? <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I think that's actually, um, that's actually a good question. And I think there's maybe some simple things we could do to, to add one. Uh, the finalizers are not ideal, because once, you, once you've entered the delete pipeline, there's no return. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think there's actually a change, a relatively simple general change that we could make to solve that problem. Um, uh, please pipe up on the. Uh, API machinery mailing list. Um, yeah, especially if you have time to help us. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody.